So let's talk about whole chromosome aneuploidy from the genesis point of view. And this is very important. I'm interested in the inception of aneuploidy, not in the downstream further permutations of those initial changes. Whole chromosome aneuploidy, what I'm talking about is that set of events in which an otherwise haploid genome might have acquired one or more chromosomes, or a diploid genome, one or more, or a diploid genome might have lost one or more. Our workhorse for this is studying zygote formation in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The well-established sequence of events is the following, that we have obviously the two haploid cells. They recognize each other. They form a zygote. Subsequently, the two nuclei have to congress. Then they fuse, and now we're off to the next diploid generation. So there was a focus especially on these stages, first by the Fink laboratory, then by others who developed what today are known as the karyogamy, or CAR mutants. And the important one for my discussion today is CAR1. Because it turns out this CAR1 mutation, if it's present in one cell and you cross it with a wild-type cell, as a first approximation, this is the end of the road, and then the cells go on budding. Or at least this is approximately what the Fink laboratory had in mind when they first did these experiments. Why did they do it? They wanted to be able to move mitochondria from one haploid cell to another, and they also wanted to be able to make better beer. And both were very successful. Now, a few years later, Susan Dutcher came along, and she did an audacious and completely unexpected experiment, which has, you might think, resulted in her having a bad reputation, but it seems to me quite the contrary. Her article was called Transfer of Genetic Information Between Strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and she built on this possibility of crossing a CAR1 mutant and a wild-type cell in order to generate this situation. And we can imagine that we refer to one of these cells as a cis and the other as the trans cell. The method that was the outcome of her work is now the standard method for transferring ungainly chromosomes from one yeast cell to another, or transferring yaks from one yeast cell to another. Her work, and that of others, pointed clearly to the fact that what got transferred was intact chromosomes. Perhaps some, today somebody has to look somewhat more closely, but as a first approximation, we're not talking about some sort of complicated fragmentation. Now, what did she do? She was selecting for those events in which you would have progeny cells that would carry a marker of the trans nucleus here, and also a marker of the cis nucleus, this nucleus. She imposed a selection whereby these progeny would need to have acquired mitochondria from the cis cell. The cis cell was re respiratory competent. The trans cell was respiratory incompetent. And she selected, using classical approaches, against conventional diploid cells. And this is the crux of the matter, really. She used a mutation known as the CAN1 mutation for this purpose, mutation that endows cells with resistance to cannabinine. So as I've already indicated, there is very little mismanagement of the chromosomes in this process. To all intents and purposes, it looks as though these fellows have gotten away with murder. It's a completely bizarre situation in which a chromosome, so to speak, can become a contortionist and exit from one nucleus and subsequently enter into the other. So I find these situations very annoying, especially if you are brought up to believe that we're dealing with closed mitosis. In other words, the nuclear envelope does not break down. Some years later, the Rose Laboratory cloned out the CAR1 protein. This is a protein of the spindle pull body, and there is obviously a logic to that. Now let me tell you where I'm going to end up before I take you step by step through this story. So let's consider once again the normal course of events. Two cells have now generated a zygote. We have two nuclei. Each has a spindle pole body in red. And they're connected to each other by a cable of microtubules. As this shortens or slides, the two nuclei will come to touch each other at the point where you have that spindle pole body. They subsequently will fuse. Now. Subsequent diffusion, the spindle pole body and the genome will replicate, and then, in a conventional fashion, you're off to bipolar mitosis, a diploid future. It turns out 
that if you conduct these crosses, as Dutcher and generations of other scientists have, what happens is, yes, you get an early zygote, fine, but the two nuclei do not know how to find each other. And the result is, while they're thinking it over, they replicate their spindle pole bodies. Subsequently, they actually do manage with reasonable frequency to fuse to each other, usually at the site where there is a spindle pole body, and now you are in murderous territory because you have a nucleus that has too many spindle pole bodies. And our conclusion from this, because we've witnessed these events, and they cluster and there's a certain number of anaphases that ensue, our interpretation of this is that we're entirely in the territory here of multipolar mitosis. That the underlying characteristic of these CAR1 crosses is that massive aneuploidy results because of multipolar mitosis occurring, and there are also, as Dutcher noticed, major inviability associated with these events. There's a central new concept emerging, and that is that the relative speed of nuclear fusion determines whether or not the outcome is going to be the bipolar or the multipolar fate. And I should point out that these studies have a definite cancer relevance in the sense that multipolarity is characteristic of many malignant cells and has been attributed variously to events of cell-cell fusion, delayed cytokinesis, problems with separase activity, and so forth. So now let me take you through some of the data that lead us to that conclusion. At the top we're looking at a conventional wild-type, wild-type cross. We get diploids. Here you see them in a microscopic field. We're visualizing the endoplasmic reticulum at the margin of the cell and also the nuclear envelope here. Nice fat, in this case, diploid nuclei in each one. And now if we look at the CAR1 cross to wild-type zygotes, and Jim Haber has been here and many others, you see quite a zoo of outcomes. You have zygotes that perhaps have three or even more nuclei. You have those that still have two, this one here. You have those that are undergoing mitosis in one or another direction. I'd like you to concentrate on this zygote here. It has an enlarged nucleus. Is it really the result of fusion? Yes. We come to that conclusion because we have cross cells that have a green marker inside the nucleus, which we know never leaves the nucleus. Another cell that has a blue marker, same story. And when these zygotes come into existence that have a single large nucleus, indeed, we find both colors. So these are the result of fusion. But what is the link? to aneuploidy, and what are the progeny exactly of these particular cells here, these particular nuclei? We're talking about a mating mixture where there'll be cells that have not mated. There'll be any of these varieties of different zygotes. We would like to be able to pull out of that population the events that are the result of the future anaphases conducted by those cells. Now, before I get there, let me go back to this cannabinine resistance. So this classical drug used for this purpose, one equally well can use cyclohexamide resistance characteristics. This gene codes for arginine permease that normally allows arginine into the cell. It also, the, the uh, CAN1 protein, can allow cannabinine to come into a cell. And so if you have a wild type cell, it's going to be killed because this cannabinine is going to be incorporated in the place of arginine. If you have the kind of mutant with which Susan Dutcher was concerned and others, well, cannabinine never gets in, the cell is resistant. But it's a recessive characteristic, and therefore if you have a diploid that has both the permissive and the non-permissive permease at the surface, and if you add cannabinine, well, you're going to annihilate that cell. So now let's consider taking a sensitive cell and crossing it to a resistant cell, and among those zygotes that come into existence, there will be some that have this sort of a fused nucleus that I've been talking about. Well, the progeny of those fused nuclei should be sensitive unless, and this is the catch, unless they happen to have lost the critical chromosome that includes the single copy of the CAN1 gene with which we are concerned, and indeed, this is where we're ending up. So I think this is a fundamental flaw in the experimental strategy that has been in the books forever and underlies the procedure that is so widely used. In other words, when both alleles of chromosome 5 are present, we have a resistant and a sensitive allele, so to speak, 
the organism is going to be sensitive. But if we lose one allele and we have only this one, it's going to be resistant. So Susan Dutcher's work in which she added cannabinine selectively to try to get rid of all diploids, well, it did get rid of all bona fide diploids, but those fellows who happened to have lost one copy of chromosome 5, they were scot-free. And therefore, I think the question is, could these fused nuclei really be an intermediate in transfer? It's no longer the question as to whether or not diploid nuclei are on the map. So how can we figure out, how can we study the progeny that have resulted from fusion of nuclei, considering the zoo of different outcomes that's present in these crosses. We don't want to select for various chromosomes, causing them necessarily to be present or to be absent, because we're back in the same conundrum that Dutcher and others have been in. And therefore, we invented a rather simple approach in which we used two what I call volume markers in order to label the two different varieties of nuclei by a let's say, slightly different means. What we've done is we've loaded one of the cells with a 2-micron plasmid coding for the LU2 gene, and we've loaded the other cell's nucleus with a different 2-micron plasmid coding for the TRYP1 gene. And so this allows us to generate a cross where one parent is LU plus and the other is TRYP plus. We use the same markers and various oxytrophies to follow these crosses. And what we do when we have a mating mixture and we allow mating to occur for a certain period of time, we know that these cells are going to be present. Well, as time goes on and they bud, we're going to select exclusively for those progeny that are LU plus and TRIP plus. In other words, the subset, however small it may be, which in fact is the result of fusion of those two nuclei. And we evaluate the drug resistance and the oxytrophies of these progeny. How does it go? Well, here's a wild type cross. Here's the CAR1 cross. If you take the whole mating mixture after eight hours of one of these crosses and you plate it on a minus L minus W plate, in other words, selecting for those events that are the result of nuclear fusion, no doubt, it turns out that a very large majority of the cells present indeed pass this test. And then by contrast, if you look at the progeny that come from one of these crosses, it is an infinitesimally small number of cells that are actually able to survive in the double selection plate. So most from the CAR1 cross, most of those nuclei that have come into existence that were the result of fusion are in one or another regard incompetent. Some of them make it, and that sliver, I believe, is what in the past many, many laboratories have been studying in order to generate their so-called chromosome transfer events. If you look at these colonies, they're big and beautiful, just as they should be. And if you look at these colonies, they're miserable. First, the yield is very small. Second, they're hugely heterogeneous in their size. And if you then evaluate a number of oxytrophies, if you ask, for example, what's the frequency of cannabinine-resistant cells, or if you follow a second marker, which is on the same chromosome, the incidence is appropriately very low. This sort of a chromosome loss event just not, does not occur frequently in such a cell. But then if you take this small subset and you ask, what's the incidence of such cannabinine-resistant uraminous cells or any of a number of other markers, it's absolutely stupendous. We have 5 or 10 percent of the progeny of these crosses, which indeed carry the characteristics indicative of resistance, in other words, likely to correspond to chromosome loss. I interpret this, but I have more to say, as evidence of massive aneuploidy, and I suggest that here included in this group are those very cells with which Dutcher was concerned. So what's going on microscopically? We're following two markers, a red marker of the spindle pull body and a green marker which marks the cluster of centromeres that's present in any of these cells. Here we're looking at haploids, and blue is the chromatin label. Early in the cell cycle, one spindle pull body, one cluster. Later, then we have duplication of the spindle pull body, two clusters. Then an intermediate I've never seen before that I call a nest, in which the two spindle pole bodies seem to be fighting it out. So this is the Naismith moment. This is the moment in which tension is trying to be established, so to speak, to make sure that each chromosome is appropriately uh, associated by, to the two spindle pole bodies. Ultimately, there's resolution and now conclusion of the cell cycle anaphase. What happens in the zygote? These pictures are very comparable to what I saw early, one spindle pole body. Now it's duplicated. We have a nest in between. 
And finally, resolution and off to the bud, just as we've been taught since we were born. And I want you now to compare that outcome to the outcome observed for the karyogamy mutant crosses. Because here we're looking at the percent of zygotes that appear that have a fused nucleus. It's a kinetic. Here's the kinetic for wild type. The half time for forming zygotes that have a fused nucleus is perhaps about two hours. And here you see now as a function of time for those karyogamy crosses, the advent of those fused nuclei events. And most people wanting to transfer chromosomes, they're way out here. But they cite the literature saying the nuclei have not fused. And so it, it becomes a conundrum and a curious self-sustaining uh, misinterpretation, I think, or over-interpretation. Now, I, I have to translate here to the PG-13 part of the talk, and you'll see what I mean in a moment. So here we have a typical zygote, and it has two nuclei, and in green you see the spindle pull body, SBC42. Well, there's one here, there's one spindle pull body, which really is two, just at the interface between these two nuclei, and here's the other spindle pull body. Three minutes later, the two nuclei have fused, and here we're still three minutes beyond that. And now we have a normally unheard of situation where we have a total of four spindle pull bodies, and rather often you get six, you can get even more than that. What else happens? Well, these might make a run for it into the bud, but more often you end up with this situation. So now blue is the out outline of the zygote, here is the nucleus. You have this, what I call, hypernest, where you have one, two, three, four spindle pole bodies, and now they're all fighting, so to speak, over those clustered centromeres that are pinioned among them. Here we have a second example. They're easy to find, a kind of Gordian knot of all of these elements trying to sort out the combinatorial nightmare in which they find themselves. The spindles are frequently complex. You often find more than one spindle in a single nucleus. This is what I consider to be a cardinal sin. We're looking here at a lack operator tagged locus, which is at one end of the spindle. By all rights, the second copy of this should be exactly at the other end of the same spindle. It's not. It's lost off in empty space here in that nucleus. So absolute terrible nonconformity with regard to segregation of chromosomal elements. And here you see a typical entry into anaphase, but is that anaphase going to be productive? Well, even Dutcher noticed early on that most of the buds are not viable. Well, I think it's very clear why they're not viable. You'll notice in this case there are four red spindle pole bodies, one, two, three, four, and each has made off, so to speak, with a green cluster of centromeres. One cluster is here. In most cases, it's only one spindle pole body and one cluster that make their way into the bud. But what is that cluster? Is this an appropriate sorting event, or has it now somehow bypassed checkpoints and made off with a non-integral or, in any event, non-orthodox number of chromosomes? I suggest that that is the case. So we're dealing with a situation in which the nuclei do not congress rapidly. The spindle pole bodies already have replicated before the nuclei fuse. Therefore, we end up in this otherwise completely forbidden condition. We have clustering probably in a so-called attempt to sort out those centromeres, which in 99 plus percent of the cases is a failure. And ultimately, the result is major inviability multipolar mitosis, and most of the survivors themselves being aneuploid. So there's a massive combinatorial reassignment challenge here facing these cells. What have we learned? I think this is a myth. We now can use this procedure with a little more equanimity, perhaps. CAR1 crosses, they provide a model for the genesis of multipolarity. And as I read the literature on multipolarity and aneuploidy, I see there are so many laboratories concerned with, so to speak, the status quo, the situation when already chaos reigns. That's not what I'm studying. The issue is, how did you take the wrong step the first time? I think we know how that happened. In the context of animal cells, a possibly analogous situation would be when two animal cells fuse to each other as Lezebdik and a number of other people have emphasized, 
as a possible major contributor to malignant behavior. We have then a mechanism to account for the transfer of whole chromosomes, and I'd suggest that this well could contribute to the sorts of events of introgression that have been nicely documented by those experts among us who study evolution. And possibly we also have a technology not to generate cells that have got one extra chromosome, but rather to fractionate the genome. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see exactly what are the rules that govern that fractionation. So as a first approximation, I'd say we're dealing with 2n minus y, although it's more complicated. We're not dealing with n plus x. Thank you. Would you like to come study my plates? Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, let's talk about it. Sure. A and it is not random. Yeah. So Dr. Fowler, there's a very strong correlation with chromosome size for a transfer. I'm not sure if followed directly from this. Yeah, you know, when she made that, when she published the sizes were not very accurate, and yeah. I mean, I think that I, I, we've that a little bit with that, so I think the correlation is correct. I'm just trying to understand how that would fit into this. We certainly have recovered half things that I would have called n plus one plus maybe something else, but they behave largely as euploids. With they behave like isomers. They mm -hmm. don't behave like n plus five because that, if you cross it, gives you an inviolable meiosis, and we don't see that. So at least some of the time, I think it has to be. Um, I think it was also this question of where do you pull your buds from in Susan Chamber that. If they were pulled polar, they were frequently dead. If they were pulled from the middle, they were different. Yeah. There, there, there is some, and I think unpublished data as well, related to that. Yeah, we, have not, we have not used any microdissection, so we can't really talk about that. Yeah. But the size question, it all depends on what are these reassortments that occur. And certainly there's reason to think you get plus one, but plus several, several, many people have documented it. Yes. So, what is it about CAR1, CAR1 mutation, that's preventing rapid fusion uh, and allowing you to get the multipolar? The CAR1 mutation has the consequence. So, normally you'd have two nuclei with a spindle pole body and you get a cable of microtubules, but that cable never forms properly when you have a CAR1 background. If the nucleus has a cable, it's usually shooting off in empty space or the other one as well. And it takes some period of time before they sort of get close enough so that the two spindle pole. Or, or so the CAR1 protein's in the half bridge. The half bridge is essential for SBC42 placement and ultimately for anchoring of the microtubule. And uh, frankly, I think the best way to think about that microtubule cable is not that it's pulling the nuclei together, but it's ensuring that when they come together, it's going to be the two spindle pole bodies that hit each other because that's the permissive outcome. But for this to happen quickly, you really do need to have the help of the microtubule cable. And if you don't have proper CAR1, you don't align your microtubules. And the result is they're swimming around trying to find a partner. And Can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. When you, uh. if you just watch microscopically, how often do you see two nuclei not fuse and then just simply go through a mitosis for one that's at least as frequent as making a fused nucleus. And therefore, you can get three, which means one divided within the body of the zygote and the other divided, and the progeny went out in the bud. And it gets worse with time, of course. Synchronous. They're synchronous. <laughs>
just wondering um, whether the CAR1 protein mutants have been studied in Poppy or some other organism in larger chromosomes and what happens. Yeah, I'm not aware that there's any such study. So I've heard rumors, but I don't know the publication. So what do you think would happen? There's no reason for me to suspect different behavior. That's, uh, I don't think we have a CAR1 homologue ourselves. Yeah. We don't need it.